And so uh, with that, we're going to get started. And uh, here we are once again in the Power of Jesus series. This is message number 33. Uh, I've been giving this message all weekend. Uh, everything we track with right here, uh, I do in other places on uh, Saturday nights and sometimes on Sunday mornings. Uh, and today's message is titled, The Faith Dimension will be in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 32. And so the question I have for you today is, are you living in the faith dimension? You and I, we live in a three-dimensional world, right? Uh, uh, time has three dimensions. It has past, present, and, and future. Even space has three dimensions. It's measured with height and width and depth. Uh, for many years, you and I, we watch TV and movies in what's called 2D, but because of modern filming technology and, you know, those special little glasses and all that, now we can watch uh, movies and TV programs in 3D, right? Where, where objects just seem to be coming off the screen toward us. Now, in, uh, in mathematics and physics, there's actually a theoretical fourth dimension in which uh, space and time are united. And probably right about now, you're saying to yourself, you know, is this Pastor John up there or is this Rod Serling inter introducing a new episode of The Twilight Zone or something? And actually, that, that fourth dimension is what uh, uh, science fiction movies and TV shows use to explain things like time travel and warp speed. And uh, uh, if we're going to talk about dimensions, we'd be amiss if we didn't miss uh, mention one of my favorite singing groups from the 1960s and 70s, right? The Fifth Dimension. Those guys were great. <laughs> Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. Up, up and away in my beautiful... Okay, it's a good thing I'm a pastor, not a singer. They had great songs like Aquarius and Will You Marry Me, Bill, and all those things. Now, uh, actually, uh, uh, scientists and science have suggested that there may just be a parallel dimension or a world that coexists with our world. And you know what? This is one of those places where science and Scripture absolutely agree because the Bible teaches that there's an invisible world that exists at this very moment and it's all around us. It's the spiritual world. And there are invisible angels, both good and bad, and they're at work all around us right now. And uh, this is what I refer to as the faith dimension. Now, the Bible teaches that there's this present world, this place where you and I can see, hear, and taste, and smell, and touch. Uh, but the Scripture tells us, uh, us of another world that's unseen by human eyes. And it really shouldn't be too hard for us to understand because the truth is there's unseen things, things going through this room right now that you and I can't see, but they're there nonetheless. If I brought a radio up here and started to tune it in, well, all of a sudden we'd hear those radio waves that are going right through this building. If I, if I turned the TV on, we'd get those TV, uh, whatever they are, satellite beams or whatever makes a television work. Uh, we can't see them, but they're there nonetheless. Uh, the same is true spiritually. See, there's this faith dimension where spiritual warfare takes place. And uh, just because you and I might not be aware of it, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means that we're not tuned in to see it or to hear it. Uh, uh, if a blind man says he can't see a rainbow, doesn't mean there isn't a rainbow. It just means he can't perceive it. Uh, look with me at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. It says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, we spend a lot of time in our world today focusing on all the material stuff, right? Things that are only temporary. But the truth is, there is another world, and it's this faith dimension, and that's where Jesus lives. He lives in heaven. He lives in the faith dimension, and you and I can live there too. Now, the context of our passages today is that Jesus and His disciples, three of them, have gone up on the Mount of Transfiguration. You and I talked about that here last week. But when they came down off that mountain, they walked right into a scene of spiritual warfare. There's a desperate father 
And he's seeking help for his tormented son. So let's look at our verses today and I'll show you what I mean. Mark 9, 14 through 32. It says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Uh, Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy to Jesus. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, the boy's father answered. Uh, It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, This kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and they were afraid to ask him about it. Now, uh, most news outlets today, they they make a declaration that, that Christianity is dying. They say that Christianity is on the decline, but the news isn't all bad. And, and the main finding that they use, the thing that, that they use to grab the headlines uh, when they do things like this is they, they throw statistics out there. Let me show you what I mean. See, sometimes you've got to read through the statistics. They'll say the number of Americans who call themselves Christians shrank from 78% to 71%. Now, take it at face value, that sounds bad. Until you look at this statistic, the number of Americans who claim to be born again rose from 34% to 35%. In other words, the number of born again believers grew by 2 million members. See, when you put it all together, what you find here is, what you're seeing here is, is that a lot of people left religion for relationship. They left a religion for a relationship with Jesus. And see, a born-again Christian is someone who lives in the faith dimension. Now, as we examine this uh, uh, dramatic true encounter here, I want to do what I did last week. I want to introduce to you a a, a key truth, and then we're going to talk about three ways to know if you you and I are living in the faith dimension. So first, we're going to look at this key truth, and this is the key truth. Jesus said it in our verses. He said, everything is possible for one who believes. That's in Mark 9, 23. Now, when Jesus said that, he's talking to the father of this demonic, tortured boy, and he says those words, everything is possible for the one who believes. Notice what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, everything's possible for the person who works hard enough. Or he didn't say, everything's possible for the one who stands up and fights for their rights. Jesus said, everything's possible for the one who who believes. And so if you believe what that says right there, if you're not already living in the faith dimension, you're ready to live in the faith dimension. So now let's look at three aspects of just that, of living in the faith dimension. Number one, true faith always embraces a healthy cycle of worship and work. 
Now, last week we looked at this famous painting by Raphael. Remember that? It's called The Transfiguration of Christ. And I had told you that uh, Pope Clement VII, he ordered Raphael out of retirement. Told Raphael, I want you to paint a painting of the Transfiguration. Raphael didn't want to do it. The Pope had the power of life and death. He said, you will do it. And Raphael painted it. And when they unveiled it, Raphael had Judas down here and painted his face exactly like Pope Clement VII. And we said last week that, that Raphael got the last word. But I want to look at this, this painting again because we really see uh, 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 twin miracles happening here, right? One's on the mountaintop and one's down in the valley. See, on the top of the mountain... You see Jesus shining in His divinity. He's, he's floating on air. But Raphael, he also captured this scene down in the valley here uh, with the other nine disciples. Now remember, Raphael was an was a old man. He was an old Italian man. So I guess it's not surprising that he painted all the disciples that look like middle-aged Italian men, right? Uh, one thing I want you to notice is that there's a, a disciple down here in the front, and he's reading a book. Like maybe he's looking for a medical cure for this boy, right? And we're going to have to, we're gonna have to forgive Raphael here. We're going to have to give him some poetic license because the truth is, uh, this is first century Israel, and, and books with bindings were still really about a thousand years in the future. Uh, uh, but look at some of the other disciples. Some of them are pointing toward this tortured boy. Other ones are pointing to Jesus up on the mountain. And if you look close in the bottom right, what we see is we see the father and the mother, and we see this little tortured boy. And the father's holding this little boy, and his eyes are crossed, and he's got this crazed expression on his face, and, and there's foam trickling down his chin, and uh, uh, his body, and really his feet too, are twisted in painful contortion. But the look I want us to really zoom in on here is the look on the face of the father, because to me that really says it all. His face reveals desperation and, and frustration. See, he's desperate for somebody to help his son. And, and to me, really, this painting, uh, Raphael has brilliantly captured this overwhelming contrast between this glorious mount of transfiguration and the troubled world that's waiting below down there in the valley. And, and that's going to lead us to a, a couple of observations about this thing I'm talking about here about worship and work. Uh, a, the first thing is, we celebrate as we worship God's glory up there on the mountaintop. See, at the transfiguration, three of Jesus' disciples, they got to see Jesus in all His glory. And they worshipped Him when they saw that. And you can call that a mountaintop experience. That's for sure. They were high up. Now, some of you may remember this. Back in 1982... There was a, a truck driver out in California, and his name was Larry Walters. And Larry always wanted to fly. He always wanted to fly, uh, fly an airplane, kind of like Earl back there, right? But uh, uh, he never had the money or the time to take pilot lessons, but he didn't let that stand in his way. What Larry did was he went to an Army surplus store, and he bought 45 surplus weather balloons, and then he went to a party store and bought enough tanks of helium to fill those weather balloons. <laughs> then he took a lawn chair and put it in the back of his pickup truck. And he took cables and clamped that lawn chair down. And then he proceeded to blow these weather balloons up with helium and tie them to this lawn chair. Then he went and got a CB radio and he hooked that to one arm of the lawn chair. Then he went and made a bag of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and hooked those to the other arm of the lawn chair. Then he went and got a pellet gun and put it in his sleeve. And his idea was when he unstrapped that lawn chair that those balloons would take him up two or three hundred feet. He'd look out and see what the world looked like from up there. And then when he wanted to come down, he'd take this pellet gun and he'd shoot those balloons out one by one and he'd come down. But it didn't work out quite that way uh, for Brother Larry. Instead, as soon as he released the, the straps that were holding that lawn chair down, it took that lawn chair up to 15,000 feet. And, and then the wind started to blow him, and they carried him right into the approach corridor at Los Angeles International Airport. He got really scared and tried to start shooting out the balloons, but he's so scared he dropped his pellet gun. Now the next thing you know, police and military helicopters are following him, 
uh, military aircraft is up above him, and even land vehicles are following Larry, right? And finally, after a, a, a few hours, the police got permission to start shooting those balloons out, right? And little by little, Larry came down before those winds could blow him out into the ocean. Unfortunately, as he was coming down, the balloons got tangled up in some high power, high tension power lines and Larry got stuck and the police and the fire department had to uh, 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 help him out and get him down from there. And of course, when he was down, they arrested him right on the spot, right? And there's a reporter there and this reporter says to Larry, Larry, why did you pull a stunt like this? And, and this was what Larry said. He said, I just wanted to see how things look from way up there. <laughs> and so the reporter said, well, how did it look? And he said, it was awesome, man. I felt really close to God. <laughs> but I, want, I told you that whole story just to tell you this, that, that being in a lawn chair at 15,000 feet does not get you closer to God. Now, now, I love going to a mountain. I've been to the Smoky Mountains and the Colorado Mountains, and you probably have too. been to all kinds of mountains. And uh, there's nothing like being on a mountain and looking out over God's beautiful creation. Everybody loves a mountaintop experience. Uh, for me, when I'm standing up there on that tall mountain, I see how big God's world is, how big His creation is, and I'm reminded of how small I am, and it, it really humbles me. But, but being up high physically, no matter where you're at, I don't care if you're on the tallest building in the world, that doesn't make you closer to God. And so for, for Peter, James, and John... This uh, Mount of Transfiguration here, this truly was a mountaintop experience. Uh, they got to see Jesus again in all His glory. And if you remember, we talked about this last week. Peter wanted to build three houses. Poor Peter, he had that foot-shaped mouth. Hey, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build a house for you and a house for Moses and a house for Elijah. And we'll just stay up here and, and worship. But like we said last week, spiritual beings don't need earthly dwellings and plus... Peter made a big mistake. He reduced Jesus down to the level of Moses and Elijah. But this again truly was a mountaintop experience. So let me ask you, have you ever had a mountaintop experience? Maybe a place or a time where, where you were worshiping and you felt or you saw God uh, in His glory in a new way. If that has happened to you, then you know, just like I know, that you don't want to come down from that mountaintop. Uh, being up there is wonderful, but sooner or later you got to leave the mountaintop and you got to go back down into the valley. And if that's you, make sure you do what these three disciples did. Don't go back down unless Jesus is with you. So, so we worship up there on the mountain, but the truth is we work in the valley of service. See, we work down in the valley because that's where you find hurting people. Uh, uh, the mountaintop is sweet because you're up there communing with Jesus. He's glorified and, and you're changed. But when you return down to the valley, you've got to be prepared because you're going to be ambushed by your own brothers and sisters. In other words, by God's children who have all kind of needs. And see, that's how we interact with each other. We have needs. They have needs. And God told us to love one another, didn't He? He said, love one another. Love each other the way that I've loved you. And see, you and I, we have to remember that the church of Jesus, it isn't a building, it's people. Uh, in the Greek, it's the ecclesia, the called out people people of God. That's why we should always be a church built in the valley and never a church that's, that's built on the mountaintop. Because see, you and I, if we're going to reach people for Jesus, we've got to be able to, to keep it real. If we stay up there on the mountaintop, all we're going to do is invert. We're going to invert with each other or invert right into ourselves. Now, uh, the, the Mount of Transfiguration, that's what we call it in Scripture. It's actually a mountain over in the Middle East, right? It's called Mount Tabor. And if you've ever been there, if you've ever took a tour of that mountain, then you know that up on top of that mountain, that Mount of uh, 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 Transfiguration, uh, uh, there's a beautiful building up there. It's a beautiful church. It's actually, there is a church there, but most of it is a, a monastery. And it was designed by that famous Italian architect, Antonio Berluzzi. Now, I, I got to tell you, I didn't really know that off the top of my head. I was kind of researching this and I found his name uh, because he actually built this monastery back in, I think it was 1924. Uh, but you can visit this place 
And, and when you do, they have these like roped off areas and you can walk through. And as you walk through, you'll see these uh, monks in these dark robes. And they're praying and they're sweeping the grounds and they're tending the gardens. But most of the time they spend telling people like us to be quiet <laughs> because they don't want anybody to make any noise up there. So they're constantly saying, shh, don't talk, shh, don't say anything, right? Now, uh, uh, sadly... Even to this day, when you go back down to the bottom of Mount uh, Tabor, you're going to find lots of people, thousands of people who live there. And guess what? They've never been up on top of that mountain, right? They've never been to that church up on top of that mountain. And the majority of these people, the vast majority of these people in this area, they do not know Jesus. But the saddest part is, those monks up in that monastery, they're not interested in coming down to tell them about Jesus. Not in any way. They're not interested in going down to the bottom of that mountain and telling those people, hey, everything's possible for those who believe. They're not interested interested in going down and telling them that Jesus can save them, that He can deliver them from this troubled world that they live in. Now, Jesus is always is the greatest example to you and I. In Scripture, He spent most of His time down in the valley dealing with hurting people. And that's a great reason why you and I should do the same thing. Again, it's wonderful to encounter those mountaintop experiences. But Jesus entrusted you and I, the disciples of our day, just like those first disciples, with the Great Commission. And to fulfill that, We've got to be down in the valley. We've got to be with hurting people. We've got to be with hurting people right in our own homes, in our own neighborhoods, in our jobs, wherever we're at. See, well, there's hurting people out there. They desperately need what Jesus has to offer. And we are the vehicle that brings that to them. We need to love them. We need to accept them. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter what they think. Doesn't really matter what they say. Jesus never gave any exceptions to the rule. He told us to go out and reach them and introduce them to Him. And so to be effective at that, we have got to maintain a healthy cycle of not just works, not just fulfilling the Great Commission, but worship too. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in the Scripture. And then we need to be out in the valley. Uh, see, when we've been on that mountaintop and we've seen the glory of Jesus... That's when we're prepared. That's when we're geared up. That's when we have the ammunition we need to go back down into the war zone, down in the valley, and help others. So again, number one, healthy faith embraces a healthy cycle of worship and work. And uh, number two, two, true faith engages in uh, spiritual warfare. Now, i got a nephew, and he loves Star Wars. And I'm constantly getting under his skin with uh, telling him Star Wars jokes. You know, I say, like, what happens when Chewbacca gets chocolate in his fur? Uh, I say he becomes a chocolate chip Wookiee. <laughs> if you know Star Wars, that makes sense. If you don't know Star Wars, well, it doesn't make sense. Or I'll tell him uh, Luke Skywalker was in an Asian restaurant and he couldn't use the chopsticks and he kept hearing Obi-Wan Kenobi say, Use the fork, Luke. Use the fork, right? <laughs> So as funny as that is, or at least as funny as I think it is, uh, when it comes to the devil, there's many Christians out there that have a, a misguided kind of Star Wars theology like that. See, in Star Wars, there's this mixed mystical energy that, that permeates the galaxy, right? It's called the Force. And the Force has a good side, and the Force has a, a dark side. And uh, some Christians... Uh, they think of Satan like that. They think he is uh, some sort of an impersonal dark side of the force. But listen, the devil and his demons are real, right? They are intelligent, uh, malevolent, uh, I don't know how to say that, malevolent and organized, right? I write it, but I don't know how to say it sometimes. I get a little bit tongue-tied. But uh, they're organized, man, and they are absolutely dangerous. Uh, the boy in our verses, was he was suffering from a malicious evil spirit uh, who tried to get him to harm himself. Uh, uh, the devil and his fallen angels, that's what demons and evil spirits are. They're the angels that, that fell with the devil, right? Uh, they can't outright kill us. They're not allowed to just come and kill us. But they can mess with you and I emotionally to the point 
where you're going to want to kill yourself. You're going to want to take your own life. Uh, the young man in our verses, again, man, the father said this evil spirit had this boy throw himself in the fire and sometimes into the water uh, to try to get him to kill himself. Uh, uh, Satan, he has the same kind of a plan in mind for every human being that God ever created. His plan is to destroy you, to destroy your family, to destroy everything about you. Jesus identified Satan's threefold plan in John uh, 10, 10. He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He said, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. If Satan had his way with you, uh, he would steal your joy, peace, and security. He would kill your self-esteem, your faith, and your hope. He would destroy your mind and your family. He only comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. Now, it's important right here to stop for a moment and to, to, to point out that not every physical illness is caused by uh, demonic control. You know, there's a lot of people out there that preach that kind of stuff. But the New Testament is very specific in differentiating between the times that Jesus cast out demons and the time that Jesus healed the sick. Uh, this little boy, though, what he was going through was absolutely demon-induced. And uh, this evil spirit caused him to have violent convulsions, which would look like sickness or disease, I guess. But there was a demon inside of this boy. He was screaming. He was foaming at the mouth. There were other people in Scripture who simply needed to be healed of, of some kind of sickness or some kind of disease. Uh, uh, you know, those things came into the world when Adam and Eve sinned. It said as soon as they sinned, sin, or, uh, sin sickness, death, and disease all came into to the world. But, but whatever the attack, and, and this is the point, this is the takeaway point today, and it's point number three in our message, true faith expects God to do the impossible. See, what our verses are, are describing here is a scene of chaos. And, and in the midst of this chaos, Jesus pulls this father and this tormented son away from this crowd so that he can, he can talk with them. And in this little encounter with Jesus and this father, uh, uh, we can find three principles, right? Number one, there are times when you and I, as Jesus' followers, we're going to fail in our attempt to help people in need. Uh, this father, he complained to Jesus. He said, look, your disciples tried to help this boy out, but they couldn't do it. Months earlier, Jesus sent these same disciples out. And he said, I'm giving you my power, my authority over demons. Uh, uh, they came back and they said they marveled at the fact that they had authority over demons and over sickness in Jesus' name, right? But you can just imagine this scene. Jesus is up on top of this mountain with three of the disciples. This father shows up with this demon-possessed boy. He says, my boy's possessed by a demon. I need some help. And you can just see Andrew walk up and, and say, hey, I can handle this. And he point his finger at this little boy and say, in the name of Jesus, come out of him, demon. And nothing happens. And so he, he, he tries it again, right? He said, I repeat, demon, in the name of Jesus, come out of him. Nothing happens. Andrew's probably looking at his finger like, did I forget to load this thing or what, you know? And, and then the next thing you know, Nathaniel comes up and pushes Andrew out of the way and says, hey, I'll handle this. He tries. Nothing happens, right? Philip tries. Nothing happens. Uh, Matthew tries. He fails too. Here's a hopeful father. Brings his troubled son to the disciples of Jesus and, and they couldn't help him. So is this an indictment against them? Is this saying something bad about them? Well, Jesus explained it to them later. He said, this kind only comes out by fasting and prayer. The disciples hadn't been fasting. The only one that had been fasting really was Jesus. But how many times has this happened today? Multitudes of hurting people come to you and I and other people in the body of Christ out there. We're Jesus' followers. Again, we're the disciples of our day. And yet they go away disappointed. And those same words that Jesus heard from that concerned father back in the first century, they keep, they keep echoing in our minds. I came to get help, but they couldn't help me. See, we have to remember that you and I are in the body of Christ. And just like those first disciples, we need to be doing certain things. Again, we need to be worshiping. We need to be reading our scripture. We need to be in prayer. But there's other things we need to be doing, like fasting and prayer. I mean, that'll really gain, help us to gain strength. Uh, uh, we are 
fallen people on this side of heaven. We're saved, but we're fallen. We still have sin in our lives. We're imperfect people. And sometimes we're going to disappoint others even when we mean well. But the thing we have to remember is Jesus is never going to disappoint them. See, all we have to do when we fail is turn it over to Jesus. If we can't handle it, Jesus will send somebody else. Jesus will never stop trying to reach the lost on this side of heaven. That's number one. And number two, B, we can admit to Jesus that that sometimes we have a lack of faith. This father didn't have perfect faith. He had weak faith. He He said, Lord, if you can do something, please help us. And I believe this brought a smile to Jesus' lips. And a lot of people read it like this. They read it like Jesus looks at him and says, if I can. But I think Jesus said it more like this. I think he said, "If, if I can. Because he looked right at him after that and said, everything's possible for the one who believes. In other words, he's telling this concerned father, it's not a matter of what I can do. I can do anything. The question is, do you believe I can do it? And at this point, you pretty much, if you're reading those verses, you're expecting this father to say, I do believe, hallelujah. And then then there's a big happy ending. But I love this father's honesty. He He said, I do believe, Jesus, but I need help with my unbelief. That's how he said it. I do believe, but please help me overcome my unbelief. See, he was was scared. Uh, He was in that place between belief and unbelief. And every one of us in this room who follows Jesus, we've all been there. But notice this. Notice Jesus. He didn't condemn him. He didn't criticize him. He didn't say unbelief. Well, no miracle for you. He granted this father's request. And by doing so, he absolutely helped this man with his unbelief. So what about you and I? I mean, maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe like this, Father, you've got a loved one out there who's suffering, maybe with a a disease or a sickness. Maybe you got kids or or grandkids or somebody you love who's who's a victim of addiction, whatever, and and you want to trust God for a miracle. But you're having a little bit of problem in that faith department. You're having a little bit of problem with unbelief. Understand, it's okay for you to say to Jesus, I do believe Jesus, but I need help with my unbelief. Because, and this is letter C, only Jesus can release you or anyone from spiritual bondage. Uh, This poor boy had been under the demonic control of this malicious spirit since he was just a little boy. Uh, Jesus, He commanded that spirit to leave and never come back. And with one final convulsion, this spirit obeyed Jesus and left this boy. And the boy was so exhausted and fell on the ground, everybody thought he was dead. But Jesus lifted him up and sent him on his way home. I wish Raphael or, or somebody, somebody somewhere along the line would have painted a picture of that scene. Maybe a, a picture of that mother and father hugging that boy as they walked away and him turning around waving at Jesus and saying, thank you, Jesus. So what about it? Do you need to be set free today from some bondage or burden? Is somebody you love need to be set free from some bondage or some burden? Look in the book of John, chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. If you sin it, you're in bondage. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen? Amen. 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 So there are two worlds, two dimensions. Brother Ben, if you want to make your way up here for a closing song. There's this physical world that you and I can see and we can touch. But there's another world too. And again, I call it the faith dimension. Uh, This is where you, you focus on that spiritual world and what's going on there. So ask yourself today, where's my heart? And so uh, we're going to pray to uh, close our service after Ben uh, plays another worship song. Amen. So Brother Ben.
today who's never received Jesus into your life and you want me to pray with you right now to receive Jesus, I'll do that. I'll pray with you. As a matter of fact, every Christian in this room will pray with you. Is there one today? Well, amen. We got a house full of believers. So in closing, I want you to remember there are two worlds. There are two dimensions. There's this physical world it consists of everything we can see and we can touch but there's another world too and it's called the faith dimension and that's where you and I focus on the spiritual world where's your heart today look at this quote from from C.S. Lewis uh, C.S. Lewis wrote since I find desires in myself that nothing in this world can satisfy the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world and see, that's who you and I are today as followers of Jesus. You and I were made for another world. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. The scripture says that the moment we received Jesus into our hearts, we became citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That's who we are. That's where we live. That's where we belong. And that's where we're on our way to. All of us were made for this other world. But to get there. We've got to receive Jesus. He's the only way, the only truth, and the only life. See, this world is never going to satisfy you. So you've got to start living in the faith dimension because it's in the faith dimension that you'll find not only the presence, but the power of Jesus. Amen? Amen.